Uh, hi everyone, and good evening, and good morning to Heather. And uh, I'll uh, I'm Sarthak. I'm from Bhopal, India, part of Red and Black and Muktivadi Ekta Morcha, which is a, a syndicalist, an anarcho syndicalist union here in Bhopal. And uh, I'll facilitate facilitate this session and. Uh, so first of all, we are recording it, and uh, like after the talk, uh, people can either raise their hands or send the, their questions uh, in the message box. And uh, today's talk is about uh, women in revolutionary unions, and uh, it's mostly, I guess, folk it will mostly focus on experience of IWW, which is uh, Industrial Workers of the World, uh, an American uh, re revolutionary union, um, particularly its uh, experiences around the time of First World War. And so uh, because I suggested and initiated the session, I'll take one minute to like justify why people, activists in India should uh, care about this. Uh, I, it's said that history is a foreign land and people do things differently there, but I, I, I suppose more so for history of foreign land. And uh, But I get a lot of things are done similarly as well because uh, people have been living in unequal and unjust societies and people also have been organizing against it and change it. So. I guess this experience of uh, a revolutionary union uh, from uh, India, from hundred years ago is still instructive and could like inspire and instruct um, activists in India as well. And like, I think it will come up in the talk, but also uh, just not the IWW, but the anarchist tactics and forms of organizing in the last last century have become in a way part of activism's fabric around the world uh, focus on direct actions and participatory decision making and activist circles and things like that and also uh, one aspect of uh, this book and I think will be part of the talk as well of uh, the politics of uh, uh, the politics politics of respectability, I think, is still uh, a relevant thing. Uh, like Trump talking about uh, the ugly anarchist few days back, and so yeah, I think it's still relevant and could be instructive and inspiring. So for this, we have uh, Professor Heather Mayers with us today. She's a historian of social movements uh, in United States and her book uh, Beyond the Rebel Girl came out in 2018 and she's currently teaching at uh, Everett Community College and yeah, I'll just stop here and give the screen to Heather Professor. All right, thank you so much for having me here today. It's early morning where I am, uh, 6 a.m., and I am in Washington State, which is in the northwest of the United States, um, pretty close to the Canada border um, on the Pacific Coast. Uh, so I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the Industrial Workers of the World, uh, a radical labor union, which is still around and alive today, and I think more relevant than ever. Um, so I do really think that a lot of the things that I want to talk about today, even though they happened a century ago, are still very relevant questions uh, to activism. So the industrial workers of the world, are also known as the Wobblies, um, are a radical labor union founded in 1905 in the United States. And during that time, uh, we see obviously a lot of class inequality, a lot of gender inequality, a lot of racial inequality in the United States. 
and the primary um, labor organization was the American Federation of Labor. And they tended to be a bit more conservative and focus on organizing white male skilled workers. Uh, the reason they did that, of course, is because white male skilled workers were harder to replace. Um, if you did a job that took a very long time to learn, when you went on strike, you had a, an easier time um, getting your demands met because you couldn't be easily replaced. So they tended to organize workers who already had the most power in the workplace. So the industrial workers of the world um, decided to form their own, own organization in 1905 in opposition to the American Federation of Labor. And they wanted to organize by industry rather than by uh, trade or by craft. So instead of having a lumber mill where there were several different categories of workers all in their own union, they would have one big union for everyone who worked in that industry. They also focused on organizing workers who were deemed unorganizable. Um, and I think you would see that similarly to uh, movements today to organize um, like workers in fast food industries, um, jobs where people think that people are only there to work temporarily or are not invested enough in the job to organize a union. Uh, so they focused on organizing similar types of workers. In the area that I study, a lot of those workers were um, working cutting trees in lumber camps. And that was um, temporary, temporary migratory labor. So they moved from camp to camp and so were looked at as people who couldn't be organized into a union. So the IWW focused on um, organizing the unorganizable. And one of the things they made clear in their founding is that they wanted to organize um, regardless of sex, race, or skill. And that, of course, made them revolutionary at the time to be open to everyone um, when many unions were racially or um, gender segregated. But one of the things that kind of became clear in my research is there's a difference between not excluding people and fully being inclusive of people. So while they didn't exclude workers because of race or gender, they weren't always a welcoming place. And that kind of depended on um, the location and the industry and what was happening um, in those cities at that time. The IWW were also very well known for um, songs, for cartoons, for kind of a, a general attitude that um, was anti-authoritarian um, and focused on direct action. And that's why I think the union was appealing to people then and why I think it really appeals to people now to look at and to study and to see what they did because they had a lot of really creative um, direct action. One of the stories they would tell is how they used to speak on the street in order to um, get access to workers who were maybe coming into towns after having worked in lumber camps or just getting off work that day. And in big crowds of people, um, one of them would say, help me, help me, I've been robbed, robbed by the capitalist system, and then go into their big speech about um, industrial unionism. So they would do that, that kind of street theater. So during the early 20th century, um, this was a time when we see kind of what we call first wave feminism in the United States. So women, particularly white, middle and upper class women were fighting for the right to vote. Um, and that fight had been happening for several decades by the early 1900s. Some states were starting to grant women the right to vote, um, but federally they did not have that right. And this is a time where white middle and upper class women were held to kind of very high standards around purity and morality. And this is also what we know as the progressive era in the United States, meaning that 
there was activism, particularly among middle class women, to try to make some reforms. Many of these reforms were around um, repealing child labor, around giving women the right to vote, around reducing working hours for women, and in increasing safety in places. And so these were all uh, reforms that were not looking for a radical change in the system. They were looking for kind of very piecemeal things to make it better. And while obviously any movement forward is good, there were battles between these kind of progressive middle class forces and the radicals who wanted to completely change the system. So the middle class progressives wanted to help working people, but they didn't really want to listen to what the working people wanted. They wanted to help shape the working class into a middle class image of respectability, which often meant, you know, women were um, staying home, meant a marriage between a man and a woman, um, meant having children, meant providing for them, meant, you know, being religious, being Christian. And so they really wanted to shape the middle class into their image. So the women who were interested in the industrial workers of the world and becoming wobblies tended to reject that kind of activism and that kind of image. So as a lot of middle and upper class women and working women did too, were fighting for women to have the right to vote, that wasn't really a focus of the IWW. They certainly were not against women having the right to vote, but they tended to have the feeling that the vote had never helped the working class man, so why would it help the working class woman? And so this um, being involved with the union provided a different avenue for activism that didn't focus on politics and didn't focus on voting in particular. The women and men involved in the IWW really focused on class as the main dividing barrier in society. They thought that women of different classes basically did not have any common interests. And they didn't really talk much about how the role that race played in women's experiences and how, you know, black black working class women had a different experience than white working class women. Um, they mentioned it and again said they weren't discriminating by class, but didn't have a real kind of nuanced understanding of what would we, we would talk about today as intersectionality, the way that um, many different identities can meet and um, add to the oppression that someone is facing. So they really focused on class. Um, there was a letter in one of the IWW newspapers from a wealthy woman who basically said, you know, we should all be banding together and just because my cage is made of gold and my chains are made of silk does not mean, you know, that I am not facing similar issues to which the Wobblies were kind of like, no, not the same. Um, your husband is the one that is, you know, owning the factory and your wealth comes from our labor. So we do not have the same circumstances. So this was really not embracing any form of solidarity across gender lines um, when it came to people of different classes. So the area that I focused on when I studied is um, what we call the Pacific Northwest. So the states of Oregon and Washington, uh, which at this time were starting to have a lot bigger population of white settlers on uh, formerly indigenous lands. And the cities of Seattle and Portland were growing. There was a large, as I mentioned, lumber industry. There was a lot of fishing and canning. There was agriculture, but there were not big manufacturing centers and factories the same way you would see in like Chicago or New York in the early 20th century. So it wasn't, the activism wasn't the same as it was back East where people were looking, you know, working in garment factories with thousands of workers and trying to organize these massive um, 
strikes or massive uh, union drives. It was much more piecemeal and much smaller in this region and focused on some different ideas around um, gender issues and women's issues. And so I wanted to talk about some of those. The history of this union had also been talked about as primarily male during this period, um, really focusing on men who were part of the union, men who were organizers, men who were um, itinerant laborers, who were hobos, um, who hopped trains, and uh, didn't really focus on, on women at all. But when I looked at pictures from the early 20th century, I could see that women were there. There were pictures of women holding IWW banners in front of um, the union hall. And so I could see they were there, but they were just never talked about as part of the story of this union. So that's part of why I went about this area of research. The kind of overall philosophy of the IWW um, was that eventually workers would organize by industry and once the, their organizing was strong enough, they would have basically a general strike where everyone went on strike and the workers would take control at that point and society would be organized along industrial lines. And they called that the one big union. And this is talked about, you know, kind of almost religiously in the newspapers that, um, you know, this, this one big union would happen and then all of our problems would be solved. And they didn't talk a lot about what that would mean for women once there was the one big union. And so they were very kind of vague about women's issues. And this came up, came up in a letter in the Industrial Worker newspaper, a letter exchange between a man and a woman. So a man wrote in and basically said, you know, what we want is that we are paid high enough wages that we can support our wives and they can stay home and raise our children and don't have to be out in the workplace. And then a woman responded to this letter and said, no, this is not what we want at all. Um, what we want is high enough wages and good enough conditions for everyone so that if we choose to marry you, it's because we love you, not because we need your financial support or protection. So these, you know, these conversations were happening around, you know, what does it mean, you know, what does industrial freedom mean for everyone? What does that mean for male and female um, relations? And Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, the famous female organizer in the union, kind of said that what it meant for them was that people would have a choice, that women were not forced out of the home because of economic circumstances, but they were not forced to stay in the home either. Um, so a little more kind of freedom of choice in that. So while the Wobblies were kind of more inclusive than other organizations, they didn't always focus on kind of drawing in women. And this issue would come up periodically in, in their newspapers. Uh, the famous Wobbly songwriter Joe Hill said we were going to have a a one leg, a freakish one-legged union if we didn't figure out how to organize women as well. Um, and the women that they did organize were primarily white women, um, not 100%, but definitely focused on white women. Um, some recent immigrants, depending on the city, uh, for example, in Lawrence, Massachusetts, during a big textile strike, uh, they organized large groups of women of different uh, nationalities of recent immigrants and did a really great job of bridging some of those divides using local leadership publishing materials in multiple languages um, and addressing the needs of those communities to bridge those divides and bring people together. In the area that I studied in the Northwest, it predominantly was women who were born in the United States or who were born in Canada. And so in that region, even though I was writing and researching a union, I ended up, you know, not looking as much at workplace organizing, but at social issues um, that women faced and how the IWW did or or did not kind of help them around those issues. And one of them in particular was um, sex work or prostitution. 
And the IWW took a very different kind of stance than the rest of society during this time. Um, in the 1910s, there was a big panic in the United States about the idea of white slavery, as they termed it. Um, and just that term itself kind of shows whose, whose lives were being valued in that. Um, the fear was that young white women were being kidnapped and sold into prostitution and addicted to drugs. And there was really very little evidence of this happening at all, but it became this kind of big thing in newspapers. There were books, there were movies about it. And this idea either was that any woman who was engaged in sex work had either been kind of kidnapped and forced into it, or they went into it because of their own moral failings, um, because they liked sex too much, or because they just um, weren't conforming to societal, you know, respectable values. The IWW saw it differently and really focused on sex work as an economic issue, um, that women were forced to do what they needed to do in order to make ends meet or provide for their families. Um, and so they really thought that if you wanted to do anything to kind of change conditions for those workers, it had to be viewed as an economic issue. Um, the IWW is still around today and still actually organizing sex workers in one of the you know few areas that is focusing on um, that type of labor um, and organizing those workers into unions. In the early 20th century, there was also starting to be a push for information about birth control. And this was illegal at that time to distribute information um, about preventing conception. So the IWW um, really took a stand on this and said that, you know, birth control and limiting the size of families was essential to working women's emancipation. Um, if people wanted to be able to provide for their families, they needed to be able to have a choice of whether or not to increase the size of their families. There was a um, female doctor in Oregon who was a supporter of the IWW. She couldn't be a member because she was not um, part of the working class. She kind of owned her own um, office but she really focused on providing that information for women and also provided abortions for women during this time period when it was illegal. Um, so the IWW provided an avenue for women to have information around preventing conception and seeing that really as part of, of their revolutionary ideals and part of what was necessary in order to move those goals forward. So I think that that made them unique at the time and also I think really appealed to a lot of women uh, because this was something that very directly affected them and they could see how this organization was was helping to spread that word. The IWW also um, similarly to anarchists in the early 20th century, um, Emma Goldman was the most famous for kind of writing about this, but talked about um, some forms of free love, as it was termed during that time period. And free love did not necessarily mean kind of promiscuity or everyone having multiple partners, but the idea was a critique of the institution of marriage, particularly in the early 20th century when marriage meant that a man had kind of complete control over his wife for the most part. Women were starting to gain more access to you know, their finances, but even at this time, if a woman tried to get a divorce, you know, the man would have control of the children um, and often, you know, controlled a lot of other things about a woman's life. So they critiqued the institution of marriage. Emma Goldman, you know, said it made women parasites, that they were, um, you know, kind of forced to survive off the riches or, you know, the wealth of their husbands. So it's not that uh, women and men didn't get married in the IWW, they did, but they tended to believe that people should be able to kind of partner, couple, and uncouple as they saw fit without having the need to justify that to the state or to any kind of religion. So that's how they termed kind of free love. Um, 
And there were a lot of cases that I saw where, you know, during strikes or during other actions where during in court, women were really questioned around um, their relationships with men, even if it had nothing to do with what they were in court for. Um, so for example, in Seattle in 1912, there was a strike among tailors. And this led to some of the organizers being arrested and they tried to deport them um, because they were Russian immigrants and they were anarchists. And there were certain laws in the books that basically anarchists couldn't be admitted to the United States and could be kicked out um, if it was kind of discovered that they were within a few years of um, their arrival. And this also applied to to sex workers, to prostitutes. There were laws on the books saying, you know, if if someone was found to be engaged in sex work, they could be deported. And so these labor organizers were arrested and they tried to kind of find evidence that the, they were engaged in, in sex work. And part of that evidence was that one of, you know, the man and the woman had lived together without being married and had moved across state lines. And part of the laws at that time were, was it was illegal to move someone across state lines for immoral purposes. And so we saw these kinds of attacks on activists, you know, again, having nothing to do with what they were doing, organizing workers, but because morality is such a fluid concept and there were so many laws based on morality or immorality during this period, it was a way to, tar to target activists and organizers to look at any aspect of their life um, that was not deemed to be respectable, that was not the kind of white middle-class Christian ideal. And so we see that the Wobblies were often, you know, talked about as outsiders, um, as not part of the community, as radicals, um, as advocates of free love and really trying to kind of scare people that they would break down, you know, what we knew about marriage and family if they were allowed to organize or if they were allowed to have any presence in cities. And so a lot of this really focused on these kinds of ideals around, you know, what it meant to be a man or a woman to, or to be in a relationship or to be a mother. And so a lot of the attacks on them were really focused on this. And the IWW did fight back on that. Um, one of the cases I saw that was really interesting was during a strike that was happening. This is women workers in a fruit cannery went on strike and they had a free speech fight. So what a free speech fight was, um, the IWW tended to speak on the street to get, you know, to get the word out. Um, you know, obviously they had newspapers that doesn't get the word out very fast. And so people would speak on street corners to talk about, you know, labor issue that was happening or just to educate people in general. And different cities tried to put limitations on their ability to speak on the street. And so what they would do if something like that happened, they would call on all the workers in the region to come and continue to speak in the street. And so as one person would stand up on a soapbox and get arrested, another person would stand up and start to speak and get arrested and on and on and on until they filled the jails and made the city kind of either decide to rescind any of those laws against street speaking or to just generally allow them to speak on the street because they overwhelmed the system. So that's what they called the free speech fights. And those happened several times in the 1910s as a way to get the word out. One of the interesting byproducts of this is activism in the jails once um, women were arrested. So women were arrested um, much less than men and they tend to be released faster. So while men were held in jail, you know, for 30, 60 days, women tended to be released earlier. And so they were able to kind of spread the word of what was happening inside the jails or what was happening to the workers who were being arrested. So, for example, in Spokane, one of the women was in the jail and she saw the way um, 
the prostitutes in the jail were being treated and that they were being kind of brought out of their cells to practice their trade with um, some of the kind of male jailers. And so they went out and started speaking about these conditions, which actually led to hiring the first kind of police matron in the city, the first female police officer to reform women's conditions in the jails. So again, this is very kind of adjacent to what the original goals were around speaking in the street and organizing workers, but they were able to raise attention to other kinds of women's issues. This happened also at another strike the next year um, where these women, the IWW women were in jail during a free speech fight and they met another young woman who was jailed um, for vagrancy, which was kind of a catch-all term for anybody who is out on the street without work or maybe engaged in sex work. And she was an 18 year old young woman who was being sentenced to live and work in a reform school for several years because they believed she was a prostitute. And so the IWW women kind of took up her case and actually organized a petition against the matron in the city jail there and tried to get this young woman released. Again, it had nothing to do with the strike but it had to do with basically they said this woman is you know being treated unfairly being held up to these kinds of high standards of purity and morality and she should have the freedom to do what she wants um, and not be judged for it and not face punishment for it so all of these issues are you know were ten tangential to organizing in the workplace but they really impacted women's lives and the way women's um, actions were judged based on on middle class values of morality. And so the IWW did kind of stick up for these women in many different places. And so I think that's what kind of drew women to the organization is that they had many avenues for activism. You know, it didn't have to be just organize a strike in your own workplace. They could find ways to speak out and be supported by the organization um, in doing different types of things. Many of the women who were active in the union were also pacifists. They were anti-war activists. And as the United States entered World War I, they started speaking out against, against that, um, you know, that the working class in the United States shouldn't be fighting the working class in Europe um, over things that had nothing to do with any of them. And the United States really cracked down on any type of dissent during this period. So any of the union halls were ransacked. You could be arrested for being a member of the union, arrested if you said anything bad about the military or the government or the flag. And so there was kind of wide scale repression and arrest of members of the union during this period. Um, so it was a really difficult time um, for the organizers. And it was difficult, I think, particularly for the kind of women and families that had been engaged in work with the union. You know, some of these union halls were kind of family centers. You know, they showed movies, they had picnics, they had parades, they had bands. Um, it was a place where people came together as part of a radical community. And during this period, you know, they were basically shut down. You could be arrested for even, even showing up. And so it really made it difficult for that radical community to form um, when there was, when you could be subject to arrest for even getting together. And I think that's part of what has interested me in this union and had kind of changed the question I asked ab about how women were engaged as I got older and I had my own children. I thought more about, you know, the, the risks that they took and about how they kind of made decisions to support the union. Um, they couldn't always be on the front lines during free speech fights. Um, so how else do they do activism? And we see this, you know, today as the you know Black Lives Matter movement is happening in, in the United States, you know, I can't go out and be a part of every march that I would like to the same way I did 20 years ago because I have, you know, children with me um, and I have to think about what are different other ways that I can participate and be active, you know, whether it's donating money or, you know, raising awareness and women face those same choices a century ago. Um, 
you know, if they couldn't necessarily get out on the front lines, they did things like helping to sell newspapers. Um, they did a lot of behind the scenes organizing, even though the male organizers tended to get the publicity and be the names that were more well known. Um, when you look at what they were actually doing, their wives were usually with them getting arrested and were helping to organize events for them. Um, you know, women were helping to, for example, edit the industrial worker newspaper. A woman stepped in to do that when her husband was arrested. So they were playing all kinds of supporting roles in addition to a few of them being on the front lines. Um, but there were a lot of kind of different ways that they showed their support and became active in the union during a time when it faced a lot of repression and a lot of arrests. And in my book, I talk about a few different women who were arrested uh, during World War I and went to jail for speaking out against the war. And one of them was a really interesting case of a woman named Louisa Livero who worked for the IWW and was a member. She was a stenographer um, for the local union, but she was also um, you know, very openly an anarchist. And there was some tension there um, in the union, and I'm, which is familiar to, I think, many activists of, you know, how of labeling, of philosophy, um, of, you know, hey, this woman is an anarchist, but she's also a member of our organization and she's been arrested. How, you know, should we distance ourselves from her? We don't necessarily agree with all of her views. And there was a an amazing set of letters in an archive between this woman and her best friend while she's in jail talking about, you know, support for for funds for her release for an appeal and about all of this these tensions that were going on of you know should we focus on supporting her or should we focus on these other members of the union who were arrested at the same time and so there were of course these kind of internal tensions and, and conflicts there as well and it really was you know, any time when there's a large amount of, of oppression, you know, from the state and people are under a lot of stress. And again, going through a pandemic during this period as well, during 1918, 1919, in the flu pandemic worldwide, it really fractured a lot of this community that was growing um, in the years prior. You know, people couldn't get together in the same way they did before. They couldn't communicate in the same way they did before. And they had to face a lot of really hard choices around you know, where does financial support go? Where does organizational support go? And that that fractured um, the union. It ended up splitting in 1924. And another interesting um, story from this period comes from a set of letters between one of the main male organizers who was jailed during this time and his wife. So their daughter later kind of published this book of letters between them. And he was talking about the tensions in the union and he was talking about how he didn't think the union was treating his wife very well on the outside and about how basically he was kind of done with the IWW. And so, you know, you can see how all of this, you know, tremendous amount of tension and oppression led to splits and disagreement and led to a union that while it still even gained in membership during this period, I think um, a lot of the the families and women that were involved tended to kind of split away from it um, as all of this stuff was going on. So it was a really difficult time period. Um, and I think it, it ruined some of the focus on women's issues around sex work and birth control um, and things that they had focused on prior to the war. So 1924, of course, wasn't the end of the union. They continued to be active. And there's been different kind of time periods of, of interest in the union. Revived in the 1960s with activism then. Um, and then in the last few decades, of course, has revived activism again. Um, as I mentioned, being involved in organizing, you know, sex workers, prison labor, um, fast food workers, you know, any kind of workers that are, you know, are often not focused on by the mainstream labor movement and interested in a lot of other social justice issues. Um, so the IWW is still very much alive. And it did organize in um, 
in the early 20th century in countries across the world. Um, you know, they, they chose the name Industrial Workers of the World for a reason. Um, and there's a book, Wobblies of the World, about that, um, that I have a small chapter in about organizing efforts in, you know, in Europe, in South Africa, um, all over the world. And so, you know, when I think of what is important to remember from the Wobblies of this period and what is inspiring from the Wobblies of this period and what we can still learn from them. Um, I think particularly about how, you know, workers' interests are not just in the workplace. You know, birth control is a class issue. Housing is a class issue. Immigration is a class issue. And to really organize around all parts of a worker's life. Um, one of the organizers I got to see speak who is organizing fast food workers right now talked about how they weren't necessarily organizing the workplace, they were organizing the worker. Basically, they were radicalizing workers and helping them understand the power of their voice and the tools that they have working together, even when it wasn't focused on issues in their workplace. And so I think that kind of holistic um, activism is important. I also think the the creativity of the Wobblies is all, always, you know, something that we can can learn from. Um, the way they used kind of spectacle and theater and song and cartoons um, to engage people in a variety of messages. You know, they made it fun and they made it interesting to a lot of people who may not want to wanted to engage otherwise. And just really different, you know, interesting tactics. You know, they talked about sabotage in some ways. They talked about slowdowns in the workplace, um, you know, doing everything to, you know, the highest level of, of detail so it slows down all of the processes in the workplace where you're really just following the rules, but you're following, following them so slowly and meticulously um, that it slows down production in the workplace. Or um, one story I read was about how they um, were working in a fish canning um, factory and they had labels for kind of grade A expensive high quality and grade C inexpensive low quality and they switched the labels so the the rich people were actually getting the poor quality and the the poorer people were getting the high quality so all different ways of trying um, to do things that they thought might might foster more justice uh, in the world and I think the other, you know, main lesson, and I see people talking about this more today in the United States than ever, which I think is important, is, you know, that there is a route to activism for everyone. Not everyone has to be on the front lines or um, speaking to a massive rally of people. It doesn't look the same for everyone, um, but there's still always ways to be involved, you know, whether it is you know, buying things created by people who were involved, um, you know, organizing transportation, you know, making copies, giving money, you know, singing songs, creating community. Uh, there are many different ways to be involved. And I think that, you know, the final big lesson is that no one is unorganizable. Um, it's really about getting people to understand, you know, their power and getting them to understand um, what they can build in community with each other. Um, even if it seems, you know, like a difficult circumstance. So focusing on, on those workers who might be ignored for, by other types of organizing efforts. So those are some of the kind of main lessons that I still see from the IWW today. Um, and I hope some of that was instructive and not, I know it's very specific to look at a, a union in one place in a small time period, but I think some of those kind of values and lessons can be a little more um, universal. So I'm happy to answer um, any questions or if there's anything that you wanted that I mentioned that you wanted to know a little more about. Uh, thanks, Heather. Uh, we, yeah, so we, you can either uh, send your question on the uh, message box or raise your hand and like uh, ask the question on this screen. Uh, so uh, one thing I have been thinking about recently is like uh, I was 
rereading your book recently for this session and uh, uh, about how IWW uh, dealt with uh, what are usually considered civil right issues and uh, like for example the free speech uh, uh, campaigns and the relevance of the tactics they use for the example uh, like uh, filling jails and uh, and directly like turning this uh, uh, in a way like uh, this could rem could have remained as uh, like a specific one person got uh, arrested okay so everyone else goes back home and things like that which usually happens but but they turn that into a uh, social organizing uh, platform and uh, like what factors do you think were uh, important in like uh, what made IWW achieve uh, to some extent the goals uh, they wanted to achieve from this tactic like I have like in India uh, many activists and organizers are being jailed today for under this uh, Draconian law, UAPA, and I wonder, like, uh, if a similar tactic would be useful in uh, fighting uh, this the state operation. So, what do you think? Whether, uh, like, were uh, having a large membership in the region was a factor, or what? What else did contribute to it? I think there's there's two angles there because I think one of them. Um, for example, in Spokane, they really drew on all of the workers in the region who could come. And so that, I think the people jailed in Spokane tended to be more um, already affiliated with the IWW. So, you know, they started out with some, you know, small organizers and they put out a call in the newspaper, basically said, anybody who can come, you know, come here and be involved in this. And so they drew from the region and from across the United States to get people to come. So that would be, you know, a, it's a more difficult way because you have to have a lot of, of organizers who are very kind of mobile and ready to drop everything and do that. But I think also what happened in, in another city, actually the, the city that I, um, I work in now in Everett, Washington, um, was that more of the community got involved. And so, you know, community members had started to kind of come to some of these um, speeches and then they started to stand up and get arrested and they weren't necessarily members of the union, but they were radicalized by seeing what happened and by seeing that, you know, as they're being arrested, then, you know, these, these organizers, these kind of trained speech, speech, street speakers are being arrested but it's starting to inspire just the people who are there watching. And so in Everett, you know, there is a, a lady who, you know, she was a widow, she had children, and she just kind of was inspired to get up by these people. And people would do things like, you know, read the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence um, and become engaged in activism that way. So I think a, a better way of being able to do this is when you know you are speaking to issues that are important in a community you know people are interested in what you're talking about and then as they start to see firsthand the repression then they started to kind of gain a little more um understanding of the the risks the activists were taking and you know hey what is so dangerous about this kind of message because what they're saying really reflects my circumstance or it um, it really speaks to me. And so in Everett, much more of the community got involved. And that, um, that became a whole other event, um, which became known as the Everett Massacre, where it, it, there was a shootout between Wobblies and some of the local vigilantes. And during the court case after that, where of course they, they blamed the IWW for beginning this shootout, um, the defense brought in all of these women from the community and they said, you know, I was there too. They weren't doing anything crazy. You know, I was there too. And I got, you know, hit by the police, you know, I was there too and I got arrested. So they were able to bring in members of the community, you know, respected members of the community um, 
to kind of join in in their activism. And so I think, you know, there's several elements of it. It's harder to have a big mobile organized group to say, you know, come into, you know, wherever this kind of hot spot is that, you know, that helps. But I think, you know, when you can really engage and speak to people, then they're willing to to step in. Um, and then once they see, and I think we see this a little now with the, the Black Lives Matter um, demonstrations going on is that, you know, more and more, I live in a, you know, a honestly, like a white wealthier suburb outside of Seattle. And there are protests almost every single day right now um, because more and more people are seeing what people are talking about as police are actually, you know, using tear gas and, you know, beating protesters, which has always happened, but more and more people are seeing it and more people are seeing that the activists aren't others. They're not just the radicals. They're not just the people coming in from outside who aren't like me. Those people are me. They are like me. And so people are, are starting to gain more strength in in their voice and seeing the repression as as more directly affecting them. And I think that's inspiring more people to get out and, and say more. So, I mean, I see a lot of parallels about, you know, things happening right now um, to some of those events. Um, there are two more questions. Uh, MS is asking, hi, I would be interested in your experience drawing parallels, especially with uh, racial labor interaction with similar movements in Europe. And second is, uh, how does IWW view outsourcing? Have they been vocal about working conditions of outsourced work, uh, like uh, garment industries in South Asia? Uh, let's see. So the the first one, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the IWW from its inception, you know, said that they were going to organize regardless of sex, race, or skill, and it happened in some areas. Um, Peter Cole, another historian of the IWW, wrote about um, the Philadelphia Longshoremen um, and, you know, their kind of interracial union activism. So it definitely, it did happen in pockets of the United States and there were members um, of all races in the IWW. And one of the things particularly um, impactful about their kind of inclusive stance was that um, they were inclusive of Asian immigrant workers in the West Coast. And that had particularly been um, a source of kind of, of violence. And the organized labor in the decades prior on the West Coast had been very anti-Asian immigrant. And so the Wobblies were very vocal about, you know, we are open to all workers. Um, but they only really organized, um, you know, Filipino, Japanese, Chinese immigrant workers in small pockets. So they talked about, you know, they talked about being inclusive, but didn't always do the work of, of being inclusive and figuring out what needs were in different communities and how to build bridges in different communities. So it really depended kind of on the locality. Um, but through, you know, through words, they were, you know, not exclusionary. Um, if that kind of answers that part of the, the question. Um, and then the other question, sorry, what was the other, the other question was about, oh, outsourcing. Um, and I'm not sure actually if there's current IWW activism around that. And I haven't seen any, um, that's a good question because I haven't, I mean, again, the, the union is still around and it is small. I mean, it's, it's not, not large, but the, you know, the issues that I've seen most organization around is around in the service industry and around, you know, prison labor and sex work now. And I have not seen a lot of, of looking at how to, to organize internationally um, and speak to issues of outsourcing now. Um, that's a good question, but I haven't, I mean, I haven't seen it as a focus, but I, that doesn't mean it isn't in certain areas. Uh, okay. Any more questions? Uh, 
It's, uh, I just had an extension of uh, this question about the outsource work. Um, and it's more to do with, let's say, colonial interests, because we spoke about like pacifist activists, but also wondering if, because the period of your book is also like, you know, the high time of colonial interventions. So I was wondering if IWW had any voice in that. There were, I think, some small pockets, and that might, and the the Wobblies of the World book, I think, might deal with this a little bit more. Um, there, I mean, they they talked about it a little, but not enough to make it the focus. I mean, it was really in the same way sometimes that they talked about like women's issues. It was really kind of much more general in the like everyone should be free. And everyone should, you know, have control and everyone should have the same rights without really getting into specifics about it, um, except for in kind of small pockets and in certain areas. So I can't speak to that as well as as much of it just seeing them writing or speaking about it in really kind of more vague general terms. Um, so I know there, there were some areas um, that were more specifically looking at it um but i can't remember the the specific details of how that activism was shaped in general the union was aware but not focused if that makes sense um much more just in the particularly around you know world war one basically that just that workers should not be fighting other workers to support the interests of the ruling class And I think that's part of sometimes, I think activists today have a little bit of wishful thinking about the IWW a century ago. Um, for example, there is a, there's a newspaper picture, and again, Peter Cole, I think, just wrote about this, um, an advertisement that was basically about the IWW coming out to fight the KKK. You know, the, the Ku Klux Klan, you know, was having some kind of racist violence in, I can't even remember what city it was. And this poster was like, you know, come on IWW, come out and fight because um, the KKK was also very, you know, anti-labor and anti-radical. And so people kind of want to hold up to this and say, look, here's an example of the IWW was, you know, fighting racists in the street. And they were in, at some points. But again, we, I think, have a little bit of wanting to project some wishful thinking that they were completely um, radical in all of the ways that we would want them to be a century ago. Um, so I think, you know, somewhere in some places overall as the organization, you know, really kind of focused on the, you know, the issues of, of white male workers in the United States more than any other. Any more hand raised? If from what I can remember from the Wobblies of the World uh, volume, I think in India, in regards to India, there was uh, Lala Hardyal, who was part of Chicago branch of IWW and was like, I think, involved in literary work, I guess, translation. And he he was one of the founder of the Gadar Party. And yeah, I think that volume has uh, more information about, uh, some, about something about India as well. So, we should check that out. Um, so I guess uh, this is it. And I would thank uh, Professor Heather once more and everyone who joined and asked the questions. And so I, I, I personally found it very helpful and interesting. And I hope. Uh, we might have an session sometime soon and uh, and, yeah. and feel free you can share my email address if people have questions or want to follow up on anything later um again it's it's early morning for me so i'm i'm a little foggy when trying to remember all of the you know the details of the stuff that wasn't directly my research so uh, if anybody wants to follow up or email me any questions that's fine too yeah, I'll, I'll share your email address with the uh, group and everyone who uh, joined. Uh, so, yeah, thanks, everyone. And yeah, thank you for having me. Uh,
Ciao, ciao. Have a good weekend. Hey. <laughs> You're pleasant. <laughs> Take care. I'm just struggling with my, I'm hey. struggling with my internet. <laughs> I wasn't that for like middle part. Okay. Uh, all right. Bye bye. See you Bye. Next week. bye. bye.